Amen. Well, you can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. We're going to continue our study through the book of Acts. And if you weren't with us last week, we got to look at the Lord's call in one specific disciple, Philip, and a call that seemed confusing in the moment. The Lord called him out into the desert in the midst of a revival to witness to one man, this Ethiopian eunuch he would find out there. And what I love is that he finds this man, hears him reading from the prophet Isaiah, and he meets him right where he's at and leads him from that place to Jesus. That man is given his life to the Lord. He then is baptized in that moment, and Philip in a moment is caught up, disappears, appears at Azotis over by the coast. And then we pick up our story today, jumping into the life of another man that will be called by the Lord. In chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, we look at the life of Saul. It says, Then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, Why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear witness of my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, he has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And Lord, as we open your word this morning... Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through the, through the life and lens of Saul and Ananias. Lord, I believe there is truth that is applicable for us today. God, I pray that we would have ears that are ready to hear and hearts that are ready to receive your implanted word on good soil that it may produce fruit. Lord, humble us before your word. Speak to us, we pray. And would you be glorified through all that we look at this morning. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. If you're taking notes, you can write down the the message title this morning, Salvation, the Call to Surrender. The Call to Surrender. That's what we're going to see not only in the coming of salvation by Saul, but in the walking out and living out our salvation through Ananias. It's ultimately a call to surrender. 
Well, we see our man on the stage here, Saul, who was in the past few chapters just behind the scenes. He was there. He was slightly mentioned. In chapter 8, he began to take more form as he is actively persecuting the church. But here, he's our man on the stage, front and center. We read that he is still breathing threats and murder against the disciples. This wasn't a momentary phase This wasn't a personal vendetta he just had with Stephen. This is a continual breathing these threats and murders against the people of Jesus, against those he will call of the way, as their title was given in the early church. But the word used here for breathing, as he's breathing these threats and murders, it actually is better translated snorting, and it has this idea of a a raging bull that's in the ring, that's, that's snorting and, and furious and just looking to the person it's going to go and trample, that it's going to gouge. You could say that Saul was a bully. No, nobody. Okay, it's, it's all right, you know. It was, it was a shot, okay. But Saul breathing these threats, this murder, this murder in his heart for these men and women of the faith, he's seeking to destroy what is going on in the church. It's an active um, anger, fury, passion. You could say Paul's an overachiever in a lot of ways. He's not just willing to say, well, I'll just try and remove the situations that come to my door. The people I run into, I'll, I'll tell them to stop. He's actively looking for these people. He's searching them out. He's seeking to cut it off completely. In fact, in Galatians 1, when he's describing his life before he was a believer. In verse 14 of Galatians 1, he says, And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Right? Saul is, is all in on whatever he's pursuing. He's, he's not just zealous. He says he was so extremely zealous. He was exceeding anybody his age. He was doing more than everybody else. If, if Judaism had a 4.0 standard, Saul was the 4.5, okay? He was that kid. He's just, he's given it all he's got to stop this. He wasn't lukewarm in any way, shape, or form, which I'd say is the one thing at this point he actually has going for him that's correct, is that he's all in on what he's doing. But we know that zeal without knowledge as Proverbs 19.2 tells us, it doesn't benefit you anything. Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. Saul was zealous. He was extremely zealous by his own definition, and yet without knowledge of who it was, he was persecuting. Of what it was, he was trying to stop. And this zeal without knowledge has done a lot of damage. Maybe you have experienced some of that zeal without knowledge, that people around you who are passionate but have no knowledge of how to actually apply that, no wisdom to rightly apply maybe the knowledge they have, how damage can be done. Well, Saul, in his zeal, he goes before the high priest, no doubt still Caiaphas, seeking letters of authority, of approval that he can go to Damascus, this capital city in Syria, and that he can have the authority to bring back any believers he finds of the way, any of those who are of the followers of Jesus. He's asking, you could say, for a warrant for the arrest of any he finds there who are representing this way, that he might bring them back. Well, we could read in Acts 22, 4 and 5, as he He looks back to his life, and when he had done this, he tells us, especially in verse 5, that the high priest and the whole council of the elders can bear witness, that from them he received letters to the brothers, and he journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. He received his letters that he asked for. He was given the authority to go outside of his jurisdiction and to go find these people of the way and to bring them back, to arrest them, to bind them, and to stop them from continuing the spreading of this gospel that they're doing so well. Now, this further speaks to the zeal that Saul has in this moment. To go to Damascus is roughly 150 miles. This would have taken him a whole week's travel just to get there. 
Okay, this, it, it points to this extremely ze- zealous man that we see in our text. He's not just looking for the guys even within his own city. He's heard in Damascus this is spreading, and so he's seeking to go and put out this fire. Some of us, we hear about that zeal, and we're like, he is pretty zealous, right? Like, I live two miles from Target. Sometimes I don't even want to get up and drive there. And he's traveling 150 miles to go and stop the believers who are spreading this gospel. But as he travels on the road, something unexpected happens for him. See, he thought his, his destination and his goal was Damascus, that that was where he would go and he would return. He thought that he was going here to persecute the church. Little does he know that on this journey, he's going to become the leader of planting the church. And he's going on the road to Damascus when there's this bright light shone from heaven, and he falls to the ground in this moment. The glory of God appears to Saul. Take note, not because Saul was looking for the glory of God, not because Saul was seeking out this Jesus who he was persecuting, no, because the Lord intervened in his life. The Lord met him on that road to Damascus and shows up in a bright light. He's laying his eyes on the glory of God in which Acts 26, 13, he says that this light was brighter than the sun. It's the middle of the day, and the sun can't even compare to the brightness of God's glory that he's seen in this moment. And he falls to the ground. I don't think his immediate reaction in falling to the ground is out of humility as much as it is out of terror and fear. And we see this as a common response in Scripture when men and women are before the Lord or before his angels. They fall to the ground. They're struck with fear and terror. They're scared they won't even live in this moment. And as he falls to his face on the ground, he hears a voice say his name. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The repetition of his name, it shows the intensity and the emotion behind what's going to be said. And this isn't the only time the Lord called somebody repeatedly by their name. Right? Abraham, Abraham was repeated. Martha, Martha. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, as Jesus would say in Matthew. What do we do nowadays? We typically add the middle and last name to intensify it, right? I have children. My son knows he's in trouble when he hears Hudson Luke Patton, and he's like, I'm done. I'm in trouble, right? Just, I'll just back away, Dad. I know there's, a, there's an intensity to that. And here in this moment, the Lord says, Saul, Saul. Listen up. He's got something he does not want Saul to miss. He's got something important he needs to ask him. And he asks him, why are you persecuting not the church, not the the apostles, not the followers of me or of the way, but why are you persecuting me? God addresses immediately where Saul is in opposition to him. He calls out his sinfulness and the way he's, he's opposing what God is doing. But in asking this question, it also shows the unity that Jesus has with the church. Listen to how uh, David Platt in his book, Follow Me, describes this. He says, Jesus goes as far as to identify the church with himself when he asks Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul hadn't persecuted Christ himself, but he had persecuted Christians. So in essence, Jesus was saying, when you mess with them, you mess with me. I love that. The way that Jesus steps in here, says, why are you persecuting me? You mess with my bride, you mess with my body, you're messing with me. Why are you persecuting me? And Saul asks a very important question in this moment, because to his understanding, he's doing all this for the sake of the Messiah. He's doing this in the name of the law. And when he hears, why are you persecuting me? He's going, wait a second, who is this that's talking to me? Who are you? A very important question, a question any of us who have found salvation in Jesus have had to ask, who are you? 
A question Jesus asked the apostles. Who do you say that I am? It's the very first question we have to ask ourselves. Well, I'm grateful that the answer to that question is not confusing, it's not hard to understand, and it's not kept from us. It's made very clear throughout Scripture, and here, Jesus is going to make it abundantly clear to Saul who's talking to him. Saul asks the question, who are you? And the response he gets, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's hard to kick against the goads. He says, I'm Jesus. That's all Saul needed to hear. The Jesus who, who you've been coming against, the Jesus who the apostles have been following and standing up for and declaring his resurrection that you've been persecuting, that you've been putting in prison, that you've been overseeing them being put to death like Stephen, the Jesus who they all were following, that's the Jesus who's standing before Saul in this moment and saying, you're persecuting me. You're trying to come against what I'm doing. And he says this statement, it's hard to kick against the goads. A goad was a rod that had a pointy end on it, like a long stick that they would use, and they would poke the back of the ox in the legs to get it to move where they wanted it to. But every now and then you get this stubborn ox that you poke, and it, it puts down its feet, and it's stubborn. It will not move in the direction, and it begins to kick against the goad. It begins to kick back and push back against this prodding that's being done. And here, Jesus says, Saul, you're that stubborn ox. You're kicking against the goads of conviction. The way the Holy Spirit is prodding at your heart through the life and gospel of Jesus, through the example of the apostles, through the death you oversaw of this bold man of faith, Stephen, whose face shined like an angel. He says, you're, you're kicking against the goads. I'm prodding at your heart and you're kicking against it. You're stiff-necked like the children of Israel were. And he says, it's hard, isn't it? You've been pushing against it for so long. But in this moment, Saul is going to finally follow. He's going to finally give in. He's going to finally allow that prodding at his heart to push him in the direction he needs to go. What we see here is an act of surrender on Saul's part. The man who's been trying to control everything going on is going to finally surrender to the one who is ultimately in control of everything going on. Now notice Saul's response in verse 6. This bold, zealous man, he's described by two words, trembling and astonished. I'm sure he's trembling because he realizes the guy I've been trying to stop is the Messiah that I was looking for, that I was proclaiming would come. The mission I'm on right now is, is in complete disobedience to what God would actually have me to do. And he's trembling because he's standing before that God of glory in this moment, recognizing he's guilty, recognizing he's at fault Recognizing what he deserves in this moment is far worse than what he oversaw with Stephen in his death. And he's trembling in this moment. He's at the mercy of God. And he's astonished. The Jesus who died, who these guys spoke of being resurrected, he's now met me on the road to Damascus and he's talking to me. And he's speaking to me. And he's calling me out. And his second question so important, a question every believer must ask if you want to be used by God. He asks the question, what do you want me to do? Now he understands who Jesus is. So then the question is, all right, you're God, what do you want me to do? You see the surrender in his words there? Far too often, we ask people that question. Hey, what, what do you want to do with your life? Where do you want to go? How do you want to spend your time and your money and the talents you have? What do you want to do? That's not the question Saul's asking here. 
He's asking Jesus, what do you want me to do? This is a man who recognizes now, if, if you're in control, then it's whatever you want me to do. There's a surrender there. And anyone who desires to follow Jesus must ask that question. But not just ask the question, be willing to walk out the answer. God's going to make very clear what He wants Saul to do. The real question is, Saul, are you going to do it? Are you going to walk this out? Are you going to be obedient to what God is calling you to do? It's easy to ask the question, God, what do you want me to do? It's easy to make the statement, whatever God calls me to do with my life, I'm going to do it. It's a whole other ballgame to walk that out when he tells you. And here in this moment, he tells Saul exactly what he wants him to do. He says, arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Two words here, arise, go. The same two words given to Philip we saw last week in Acts chapter 8, verse 25. What did he tell Philip to do in the midst of a revival? Arise and go to the desert. Right here, what is he calling Saul to do? Arise and go into the city, and then I'll tell you what to do. And what we're going to see in Ananias in this same chapter, he tells him, arise and go to the street called Straight. The same phrase used three times for three different men. Arise, to get up, to wake up, to stand up. Don't sit back and relax. Don't sleep away your life. Don't fold under the pressure of the things going on around you, but rise up. God is calling the, the church today to this same command, that the church would rise up, stand up for the truth, to stand firm on the Word of God, to not give in to fears or pressures around us, but to stand and arise, but not just to stand, then to go, to move forward, to take action, to apply with our lives the things he is calling us to do. God isn't calling Saul to stand around, but to go live in light of what he's just become aware of, of who Jesus is, of what the truth of the gospel actually is, and who he is now a witness for. He says, you need to arise, you need to get up off of the ground, but you need to go. You've got a mission just like Jesus commanded the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, the great commission, right? To go and make disciples of all nations. Not to stay, to go, to go out. Now realize the voice of the enemy has a different call for your life. The words of the enemy, the command of the enemy for you is not arise and go. It's actually sit and stay. Sit in your sin a little longer. Allow lies to continue to spread. Sit and allow evil to continue. Sit and let someone else get up and deal with the problems around you. Just sit there in your comfort and stay. Stay in your comfort zone. Stay away from risks. Stay away from anything that's hard or scary or might cost you something. Stay in your life lived in the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Stay in that ungodly relationship. Stay in that addiction. Stay in that space of complacency. Stay in your depression and anxiety. Just sit there and stay a while. What God calls you to arise and go and do today, the enemy says, sit and stay a while. You can do that tomorrow. There'll be time to deal with that later. Just sit here and stay. But God's voice is very different. God's instructions are that you would arise out of that and you would go and actively live for the Lord. Paul himself would give this same sort of command to the church in Rome, in Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, when he would say, you know the time that our hour has come for you to awake from your sleep, for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. 
The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The same call Saul received, he later, the apostle Paul, would give to this church in Rome to wake up and rise up out of your sleep and to go and put on the Lord Jesus Christ, to go and live out the gospel The enemy is never too busy to rock the cradle of a sleeping Christian. He will gladly continue to to dole you off into sleep if you're willing to sit and stay a while. But God would call you to wake up, to rise up, to stand up, and to go and make a difference, to go and stand for the truth, to not sit back and wait for somebody else. And what are his instructions here to Saul, go into the city, and then I'll tell you what you need to do. There's no question about who's in control in this moment. He says, you just go into the city. That's all you need to know for now. Just like when he told Philip, you just go out into the desert. You don't need to know anything else right now. You just need to know who I am and what I'm calling you to do right now. And the first right step is to go where I told you to go. And then I'll tell you what's next. Well, the men have to lead him by hand to Damascus because as he opens his eyes, he can't see anything. He's been blinded. That bright light, brighter than the sun, it's taken away his sight. And in this moment, he has to be led by men into the city. Now, what's interesting here is that this man who's physically seen fine his whole life and yet was spiritually blind, now in this moment when he is physically blind, make no mistake, Saul is seeing life clearer in this moment than he ever has before. He's seeing life for what it truly is in this moment like he never saw when he had his physical sight because his spiritual eyes have been opened. And although he's blind, let me tell you, he can see the truth. And he's led into the city. And as he's led into the city, it says that three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Many believe, and I would agree with them, out of shock. Imagine dedicating your whole life to what you believe to be the truth, and in this moment, you realize you've been coming against, killing, and seeking to stop that which God is doing. And he's in shock. The Jesus he tried to stop is the Jesus who's now calling him to service. And in this moment, he doesn't even have anything to say. We're going to find, as the Lord speaks to Ananias, that he's just sitting there praying, praying. A man who's prayed, no doubt, most of his life, as was part of their tradition, multiple times a day, but he's praying in a way he's never prayed before. He's speaking to a God he never knew like this before. And for three days, he's not eating. Much like Jesus, who was in the grave three days before he rose, we see Saul going to this place three days, no food, no drink, no sight, a dead man who is going to rise to a new life. And while he's sitting there praying, not eating or drinking for three days, we see the Lord already working out the plan and the life of Ananias. Now take note of the description we're given about this man, Ananias. In verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Not a special disciple, not a super spiritual disciple, not a sinless disciple, Just an ordinary, certain disciple that was in Damascus. This ordinary man that God used in an extraordinary way. I love that God is redeeming the name Ananias because if you've been with us through Acts, you've seen Ananias and Sapphira and the hypocrisy they lived in and how it cost them their lives. But here this name is redeemed for us. The name that means God is gracious is going to be demonstrated in the way God will use this man who no doubt was on the list of people to go and arrest and persecute when Saul got there. 
And yet, because of God's grace, he's going to use him to go and pray for Saul to receive his sight once again. That's the grace of God. Not what Saul deserves, but what he's going to receive. And when the Lord calls Ananias, Ananias responds. He says, Ananias in a vision, and Ananias says, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I'm ready. I'm available. I'm listening. I'm willing. Here I am. Like Isaiah, who would say, Lord, send me. I'll go. Here am I, Lord. Send me. It's been said that your greatest ability for God is your availability. Think about it. We really can offer God nothing. He can do it far better himself, but he chooses to use us. And if we want to be a part of what God is doing, be available. Be ready. Be willing when he calls you. Far too often when God calls men and women in Scripture, they brush it off or they delay it or they make excuse for it. I think of a man like Moses when the Lord calls him and he's like, but but I'm, I'm not good with my speech. Lord, send somebody else. Do it through someone else. Lord says, all right, I'll send Aaron with you. That's going to turn out well. I've heard a pastor say that we have the right of first refusal. But all you're doing is missing out on being a part of what God is going to do, with or without you. But here Ananias, he's available. He hears the call of the Lord and he says, here I am, Lord. Tell me what to do. I'm ready. I'm willing. And the same command is given to him that was given to Saul. Arise and go. Get up and go to the, to the street called straight. That's a tongue twister. He tells him, arise and go. None of us are exceptions to this. God is calling each and every one of you to arise and go. And he tells him to go into the city. He tells them to go to the street called straight. You know, I love the, the way King James version puts Matthew 7, 14, because it says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. What's the name of the street he will find Saul on? It's the straight street, because this is a man, Saul, who is now on the straight and narrow path. This is a man who was once on that wide road which led to destruction, but now is a man who is on this narrow, straight path which leads unto life. Now, this straight street was one of very few streets, actually, in Damascus that was actually straight. In fact, if you go visit, you could still see it there today. But he says, you're going to go there and you're going to find Saul, and he's praying. And I've already given him a vision that you're going to come and you're going to lay your hand on him and you're going to pray for him, and he's going to receive his sight. I find it interesting that the Lord doesn't just say, Ananias, I want you to pray for Saul, and right now he's going to receive his sight. Could the Lord have done that? Absolutely. The Lord didn't need to use Ananias at all. But he tells Ananias, I want you to go to him. I want you to place your hand on him, and I want you to pray for him to receive his sight. God is calling him to go to the man who was supposed to bring persecution to this place. I want you to lay your hand on him. I want you to come alongside him. I want you to touch him. I want you to pray for him. To extend what we could call the right hand of fellowship that Paul later will speak to in Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, when he says, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. I hope this is our answer as well when someone comes to Christ, that our first response is not to say, Really? Do you really think they're saved? Like, I know who they were before, and we begin to question, but that we would be as willing to say, I'm going to extend my hand, the right hand of fellowship. I'm going to come alongside this person. I'm going to welcome them into the family of God. I'm going to invite them into my life. There's a world that is constantly trying to divide even believers amongst each other. But would we, the people of God, be led by His Spirit his spirit in unity in the bond of peace and be willing to go to those who nobody else is going to go to. There's not a group of Christians lining up saying, I'd just love to run into Saul today. 
No, they were doing everything they could to avoid this guy. In fact, we're going to see Ananias here. He's a little hesitant because he knows who Saul is. He's heard about him and what he's coming to do. But he's calling him to go. He's calling him to come alongside and to touch him. His response, Lord, I've heard from many about this man and the authority he has here, that he's coming to arrest us and take us back to Jerusalem. I don't blame Ananias for the fear he has, for the hesitation knowing what this man has come to do, and now God's calling you to go and voluntarily go and meet him in person. But no matter his concern, he was forgetting who ultimately had the authority in this moment. He's looking at Saul, a powerful man who's been given authority in Damascus, and he can do what he wants with me, God. But who is Ananias' ultimate authority? Who is all of our ultimate authority? Well, Matthew 28, 18, the verse before he gives the apostles the Great Commission, Jesus makes clear, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Saul might have some authority that he's been given by Caiaphas. He might have letters that tell you he's over you in this town, but make no mistake who's in control because Jesus has the ultimate authority. No matter who rules over us, no matter who's in charge of us, they are still under the authority of Jesus. And so in this moment, God doesn't condemn Ananias because of his fear, but he doesn't allow him to sit in it. You still need to go. Twice he tells him, go, Ananias. Get up and go. I know you're scared, but I'm in control. And not only am I in control, but this is a chosen vessel of mine. He may have been a vessel previously for dishonor, but in this moment God says, no, no. Saul is a chosen vessel of mine that I'm going to use for honor, that I'm going to use for good. You heard of his plans in this city. I've changed those plans. I've rewritten his story. I've changed his ways. He's going to be a new creation now. And he's my chosen vessel. So go to him. And it's always interesting that we read here what he tells Ananias he's going to reveal to Saul. He says, go to him and pray to him they may receive his sight and I will show him the things that he must suffer. Not, I, I want to go and show him all the pleasures that believers have. I want to show him the abundant life in Christ that he's found. I want to show him his, his hope and his future and the excitement behind it. I want to show him all the things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. Well, we can read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, just a short condensed list of the many things that Saul would go on to suffer. We read five times, I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys in danger of rivers, in danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers in toil and hardship, through many sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Yeah, I could say Saul's going to suffer a little bit. We read about one of those things in the life of a believer, and we're like, man, you've, you've been through a lot. We read about that list of suffering, and you're like, how are you still alive? (laughs) Shipwrecked multiple times? I think after the first one, I wouldn't get on another boat. You spent a day and a half at sea? You were stoned? And not only will we see he's stoned, but he gets right back up and just walks right back into the city to keep going and preaching that gospel. But the Lord, he's going to tell Saul. He's going to show Saul all the things that he must suffer. Do you realize as a believer you will suffer? It's a guarantee. I know, happy Valentine's Day. That's what you wanted to hear. You don't read that on a little heart candy, right? 
happy Valentine's Day, you will be mine and you will suffer. No, but, but that's what he tells him here. You're going to suffer for my name's sake. It's a guarantee. And Ananias goes to him. And he enters the house of Judas. And he sees Saul sitting there, blind. And I'm sure in his mind he's thinking, I can still get out of here. He doesn't see me. He doesn't know me. I could, I could sneak out the door. He'd never know. And I find it funny. Maybe it's sincere, but he says, Brother Saul. And I'm thinking, if I'm in that situation, I'm probably doing the same thing. Hey, man, bro, we're on the same team now. I'm going to lay my hand on you. Jesus told me to. He said he told you I was coming. And, and a little timid, he's like, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Okay, now that backs away, right? The man who came to put you in prison, and you're praying that he can see again. But he prays for him. And Saul receives his sight. These things like scales fall off of his eyes. And Saul, we could say, is now Paul. Though his name will not be changed yet, his life is completely changed. He's a man who is now filled with the Holy Spirit, is baptized, and is making the decision, the Jesus I came to stop is the Jesus I now serve. And then the church that I wanted to bring to nothing is now the church that I'm going to go on and continue to plant and continue to preach the good news of what I found in Jesus. And we can have a tendency to look at a life of, like Saul and say, well, well, clearly he needed Jesus to intervene. This was a murderer. He was a vile man. He was wicked. He was so zealous for all the wrong things. And we can lose sight of the fact that we are all Saul. That we were all enemies of Christ. That every one of us deserves the same penalty Saul deserved. We deserve hell. We deserve suffering. We deserve separation from God. And it wasn't that Saul cleaned up his life and changed his act and looked for the Lord. It was that God met him on that road. God interrupted his story and placed himself into it. And our lives are no different. We didn't deserve for Jesus to jump into our story. But his loving pursuit, it met us somewhere, some way. Maybe you didn't have the road to Damascus story. Maybe it was in more subtle ways that he led you, he spoke to you, and he brought you to the point where you said, all right, enough is enough. It was his kindness, as Scripture says, that led you to repentance. But here's what I know. You had to ask those same two questions. Who are you? And what would you have me do? Now, I hope and pray that you've received the answer to both of those. But we don't want to close this morning without giving you an opportunity to respond to that today. Maybe you've been asking for a long time, who are you? This Jesus that I hear about, that I read about, that other people speak about, that I don't really know, who is he? Well, he is the Son of God. He is your only hope of salvation. He is the one who lived a perfect life you couldn't live to pay for your sins on the cross and rose again three days later from the grave to offer you a new resurrected life, an eternal life. And it's not all rainbows and sunshines. God didn't spare Saul the suffering, and you're not going to be spared it either. But it is truly an abundant life. It is a life with hope. It is a life with purpose. It is a life with value, and it's found only in Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. It's only through Jesus. That's the who he is. But what would he have you to do? Well, first and foremost, if you have not made the decision to surrender, to repent, that's what he would have you do first. He would call you to repentance of your sin, to turn away from that life, and to surrender to the lordship of Jesus. Now, make no mistake. Whether you acknowledge it or not, he is lord of your life. He is in control of everything. But you have an opportunity to be on the right side of this fight, the side of victory, 
You have an opportunity to surrender your life to the one who is in control of it. And he would call you first to repent and then to go where he calls you to go and to do what he calls you to do for his glory. Because you see, Scripture says we've been bought with a price. Therefore, what's the conclusion? We are to glorify God with our body. And so I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. But I want to take a moment before we, we close out in prayer to ask if there is anyone here who has not made that decision, who has not called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved, who hasn't surrendered their life to Him, that you would make that decision now because I believe the same Holy Spirit that was prodding at the heart of Saul may be prodding at the heart of you this morning. Don't kick against the goads. Don't be stubborn against the conviction the Lord might be weighing on your heart in this very moment. And if that's you and you want to make the decision to follow Jesus, to surrender your life, I would ask that you would raise your hand or rather that you would actually stand in this moment so I could see you because we want to pray for you. We want to extend that, that hand of fellowship and welcome you into the family of God. We want to come alongside you in this new life you found in Jesus. Is there anybody in this moment that would want to make that decision? Well, then I will trust that all of us standing here today have made that decision, that we've answered that call of the Lord in our lives. But here's what I would challenge you with. As we move forward, as we close in a song of worship, as we, we leave this place and go out with our plans for the day, that you would live a life of surrender to the Lord. Surrender isn't just a moment when you give your life to Jesus. Surrender is a lifestyle that we choose to live each and every day where we deny ourselves, we pick up our cross, and we follow Jesus daily. And maybe even for some of you today, You've made the decision to surrender to Jesus, but now you find yourself today holding on to things you haven't yet surrendered. He's not asking for partial surrender. He's asking you for absolute surrender. And I love the statement that says, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. He's not asking for a piece of your life. He's asking for all of it. And if there's a piece you still need to surrender, do that today. We're going to have people available for prayer over here on the side. Man, if, there's some, if you just want to come and get prayer because you know he's calling you to surrender something right now, to lay it down and you don't want to, arise and go get prayer. Get up out of that bondage to that thing and go and walk in the freedom, in the liberty that is found where the Spirit of the Lord is. And as we go from here, we go in celebration. As we close in this song, we celebrate the freedom we found because here's the reality. We surrender to Jesus, recognizing the defeat of sin over our lives. But we arise in victory because of the finished work of Jesus. And so we don't surrender to defeat and condemnation. We surrender but stand in victory. And we get to celebrate the victory we found in Jesus and the hope we have moving forward. So we gladly continue to surrender because we know that there is victory in Jesus. We know that we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And we continue to walk in surrender with hope, a living hope of the one who paid the price for us. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for that reminder this morning. Lord, that you sought us out when we were enemies of your cause. That while we were still sinners, you died for us, and we only love you because you first loved us. Lord, we don't stand here today with the hope of salvation because of anything we've done, but because you pursued us in love. You called us out of darkness into marvelous light. You've given us a hope and a future we don't deserve. And Lord, we want to walk in surrender to your will today. 
God, I pray for any who are here this morning and are battling with that surrender. Lord, it's, it's a situation, it's a relationship, it's, it's a bitterness towards someone that's wronged them. It's a struggle with a decision they know they have to make. And they don't want to surrender. They don't want to give it up. I pray that in this moment it would be your kindness that leads them to repentance. That you would bring them to that reality that Peter had, that you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? That they would recognize that that your love is better than life, God. And that anything we lay down is not worth comparing with what you give us in Christ Jesus. That as Paul said, the sufferings of this world, they're not even worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And that comes from a man who has suffered more than we could ever imagine and who saw your glory in a way we, we've never have. God, would you be honored in the way we move forward this morning? Would we arise as the church of Christ and go and do that which you're calling us to with a life of surrender but the hope of salvation? And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen.